welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Tammy Arinder. So glad you've joined us. We know you have questions about COVID-19 that are unique to rural America. So tonight, we're going to open up our phone lines and give you a chance to talk to the experts, those on the forefront of this crisis. The number 877-731-6733. You are a big part of this show, so join the conversation tonight. Again, that phone number is 877-731. 6733. Joining us live tonight from Omaha, Nebraska, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold, and live in Middleburg, Pennsylvania, Congressman Fred Keller from Pennsylvania and Middleburg there. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. A very important show. Dr. Gold, let's start with you. Let's get an overview, first of all, of how widespread COVID-19 is in rural America right now. Thanks, Tammy, and uh, thanks to everybody for joining us on uh, Rural Health Matters tonight. So the uh, numbers, of course, uh, in the United States uh, just continue to rise. And as our first graphic will show you, uh, we're almost at 4.7 million confirmed cases across the United States and uh, just over 155,000 uh, confirmed deaths. And as we've said repetitively, there's been a continuous shift uh, from not only our large cities uh, across the great southern states of South Carolina and Florida, uh, Louisiana, Texas, uh, Arkansas, uh, into uh, California, but into the central part of the United States. And we've been seeing upticks uh, in Kansas, uh, uh, in Iowa, in, uh, uh, here in Nebraska as well, uh, although not quite as substantial uh, as we've seen in other parts of the country. The numbers in both the rural and urban communities, and now even some of the smaller farming and ranching communities, uh, continues to rise uh, a good deal as well. If you look at the trends uh, over the last months of this pandemic, and I think our next graphic will give us a good idea about that, uh, what it shows is that we peaked out uh, in late April, early May, uh, with not only our seven-day rolling average, but the total number of new cases reported per day in the United States, and then fell until mid-June, early July. And so uh, just about the time uh, of just before the 4th of July weekend, we started to see a bit of an uptick across the United States, and the last several weeks have uh, brought us to as high as uh, just over 70,000 uh, confirmed new cases per day. Fortunately, over the last several days, uh, uh, the, the information has been somewhat better. We're down uh, from the 70,000s to the 50 to the 60,000s, and is down as low as I believe yesterday, uh, 47, 48,000 uh, cases per day. Now, tragically, these not only convert into hospitalizations, but as the next graphic will show us, uh, they also convert into deaths. And what we can see here is that we had a large peak, particularly when uh, New York City and the tri-state metropolitan area on the East Coast uh, were peaking in uh, <clears throat> late April and uh, early May. We saw a significant fall off in the number of deaths per day, confirmed deaths from COVID per day, uh, through June uh, into early July. And that reflected, first of all, better understanding of the treatment of the virus, keeping people uh, out of the hospitals, but also a definite shift to a younger, healthier generation of Americans. And indeed, what used to be predominantly nursing homes and long-term care facilities has been rapidly translated uh, into social gatherings uh, that has resulted in a really lower death rate. But as this graph shows, particularly the seven-day rolling average, which is the dark line, Tammy, that has continued to show us over the last several weeks an uptick and that's because these young, healthy people, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, have parents and grandparents, next door neighbors, uh, friends, uh, co-workers who are older, uh, who may be more vulnerable due to medical conditions. And that's resulted in an uptick in hospitalization, particularly in Florida and Texas and Arizona and in California. And as we look at these hotspots across the United States, you see the deep red colors uh, where we're seeing the growth of these cases along the southern belt, uh, deep into Texas, uh, and of course, uh, southern and central uh, California, uh, Tucson, uh, uh, Scottsdale, uh, Phoenix, uh, 
and, and many other communities across the United States. We are starting to see a flattening of the curve uh, in these areas, but unfortunately, uh, hospitalization and fatalities are lagging indicators, and so we're going to be waiting for a good number of at least two to three weeks before hopefully we can start to see a plateau. So that's the state of the art of the spread of COVID uh, as we are today. Where we are now, interesting to look at those numbers. Now, Dr. Gole, I've heard from Dr. Fauci at the White House that he's even now recommending that people wear goggles, not just the mask, but the goggles to keep from spreading the virus. What's, what's your take on that? Well, there's been a number of recent studies that, that have been important in that area. One is a study that shows that spread through the lining of your eyes, known as the conjunctiva, uh, can actually transmit the virus. And so uh, months ago, uh, most of the healthcare systems in the United States went to an eye protection mode uh, for our healthcare professionals, either goggles or face shields or, or something along those lines. But in the last several weeks, there's been a good deal of literature, some of which related to the World Health Organization position, and some of it actually related to uh, research done in our own institution by Dr. Santarpia and Dr. Lowe, showing that you can recover live virus from the air. Now, we don't know for sure that the infectious load is high enough. So, for instance, we do know, like with measles, that measles is transmitted through airborne spread, so-called aerosolized spread, and that it can cause infection with a very, very small number of live virus particles. We don't know that for sure with COVID, but I'm guessing uh, uh, that what Dr. Fauci is thinking is we want to at least create that awareness. So it all comes down to the appropriate social or what I like to call physical distancing. And of course, what I mean by that is maintaining the six foot distancing among and between individuals, particularly when we're in closed spaces, particularly when we're caring for somebody that we know may be sick or we suspect is likely sick with COVID. We want to protect ourselves from those tiny little droplets. We want to protect our nose and our mouth and, of course, our hands through hand sanitizers. But we also now want to protect our eyes. And that's why either wearing glasses or some other type of eye protection is probably in our best interest under those circumstances. All right, that makes sense. Now, Dr. Fauci has also called out several states recently because of their current responses to the coronavirus. What would you both say to that and to state and city leaders who maybe are not following the recommendations and they're actually leaving things open? Um, Dr. Gold, we'll start with you again. Well, again, uh, I'm not so sure this is a matter of uh, rules and regulations as much as it is a matter of personal responsibility for ourselves and for each other. You know, we're, we have spoken not only on this show, but on every evening newscast, every print uh, media uh, across our nation and probably around the world of what the simple protective measures are in terms of hand sanitizers, surface cleansing, social distancing, the six foot rule we just discussed, facial protection, etc. And so to the extent that, quote, mandates uh, help, you know, I'm all for them. But at the end of the day, uh, this is about each other taking responsibility for the communities that we care about, for our own loved ones. And, you know, uh, as I like to say, I wear a mask to protect myself and to protect others. Some who I know are ill or elderly uh, who are at high risk, but many of whom are not. You know, the, we all are aware of the recent story of the choir practice in one of our southern states where one individual turned out to be ill, of course not knowing it, and almost the entire choir ended up getting infected, several of whom ended up hospitalized uh, with COVID-19. And so uh, we have a moral and ethical responsibility uh, to take care of our communities. And frankly, if, you know, back to school, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, is something we want to do. We want to go back to athletic events. We want to go to church. We want to reopen in a meaningful and sustainable way uh, at a time before we actually have a deployed, effective, and safe vaccine, that's the only way we're going to get there. And, uh, and so uh, anything we can do uh, is going to be helpful. Right. Still up to the individuals. Uh, Congressman Keller, would you like to weigh in on this? Yeah, I, I would say the, the same thing. We need to make sure that, yeah, I'd say the same thing. We, we need to take a look at, at uh, who we're around and, you know, do, do the appropriate uh, 
uh, guidance uh, from CDC, from the Department of Health, uh, making sure that we're taking care of ourselves and our fr family and friends, and particularly those who are most vulnerable to, uh, to uh, having a really severe problems with the disease. So um, I know that uh, the, the attending physician in the house, uh, we, we've, we have the guidelines for our office and we do the social distancing and the masks and the hand sanitizer. And I would just say that uh, as a community, we need, to, we need to take a look at that and, and take the appropriate precautions to make sure we keep uh, ourselves and our family and our friends uh, safe and we, we continue to flatten the curve and, and come through this. Absolutely. You know, I, I liken it to we had to get used to wearing seat belts, right? And now it's just part of the habit right, when you exactly. get in the car. Well, now putting that mask on has become part of my natural routine now of, of getting dressed and, and leaving the house at, you know, whatever time yeah, of day. So, so. I, I, won't, I won't leave home without it. You know, there you, you go. go. Uh, <laughs> yes. And so we've all gotten so creative now. You can show your school yeah. spirit. You so can show you your know, hobbies. Uh, there you go. You know, Tammy, this, I think there's one other feature about masks. And like, you know, let's take uh, Arizona, for instance. Uh, they're recently reporting a 20 to 24 percent, I believe, positive test rate. That is very different than a community that's reporting uh, under 1 percent or a 1 percent positive test rate uh, for their community. And therefore, there may need to be different rules in those communities and different expectations on behaviors. You know, we, with good data, good testing, we can continue to monitor this. But certainly in a community that's seeing a huge amount of transmission, particularly for what we call community spread, meaning we can't trace the source of the infection, uh, that's where the social distancing and mask wearing is going to be absolutely critical. And whatever it takes, we need to do it. Absolutely. Dr. Go, a little earlier, you showed us the graphic. We talked about the shift in cases to rural America. Can we expound on that a little bit? Sure. You know, uh, early on when the pandemic first hit, uh, it hit cities that were large transportation hubs. You know, think about airports that had a lot of international flights. Uh, and as you see in this graphic in the pink, it shows you what's happened since the very beginning of the pandemic in the large urban cities uh, with the first major outbreaks. But over time, the rest of the country has more than caught up and actually exceeded that. And that's because of travel uh, in the cities, uh, from the coastal cities uh, into the inner parts of our country. And as the cities, uh, you, know, uh, you know, just like where I'm talking to you from, Omaha, Nebraska, you know, there's a lot of business exchange and cultural exchange and family travel to our rural farming and ranching communities. And all it takes is, you know, one or two small cases uh, in one of those communities, in a long-term care facility, in a meatpacking plant, uh, in a school, in a church. And before you know it, it's like uh, striking a match in a tinderbox. And, uh, and there's an outbreak that, that needs to be monitored and, and cared for, and, uh, and the numbers just continue to explode. So there was a long time that most people living in rural America, uh, you know, didn't know anybody who was infected, never had a friend or a relative that was hospitalized, and, you know, fortunately, never knew of anybody who lost their life. But I was recently on a Zoom call with uh, 15, to honor 15 physicians who lost their lives at just one host, large hospital system on the East Coast, you know, an institution that I know well. And, uh, and these are people, to a large extent, who I've known and, uh, and even worked with at one time in my life. And so it gets very personal uh, when you see that type of loss. Absolutely. has certainly gotten personal. Um, let's talk about rural hospitals right at the crux of what we deal with in rural America because there's already limited access, limited hospitals in rural America, and they are struggling right now trying to keep their doors open. According to the National Rural Health Association, in the last 10 years, 124 rural hospitals have closed, 453 at the risk of closing. Dr. Gold, what do they need to stay operating? Well, they need the support of the entire health care system. You know, all of the hospitals in the United States, at least all the ones that I'm aware of in the region that I serve, but I also have the honor of, of working closely with the American Hospital Association and, and many, many others, 
or that care for both small, medium sized and large academic medical centers have seen a very significant and appropriate fall off in what I would not just call uh, elective procedures, but routine hospital business. Let's face it, uh, I wouldn't call getting your hip replaced or your cataract uh, treated uh, or having a follow-up mammogram or an endoscopy or a cardiac stress test uh, elective procedure. These are all things that are done uh, in a way to keep people healthy. And all of that has been pushed back. Emergency room visits are down, immunizations, well baby care, all of those things have really been pushed out. And that has had a dramatic effect on our hospitals and our hospital employees. Uh, many have actually had to lay off or furlough uh, some of those individuals. Uh, and those economic consequences are just like they are in the retail business and just like they are in many of the other service businesses have significant financial implications, including bankruptcy and uh, loss of viability of some of our rural and urban hospital systems. And tragically, many of our rural hospitals have really lived right on the brink of financial viability for a long time, and that has a lot to do with their location, uh, the, the shrinking population in many of our rural communities. And indeed, many of these rural hospitals have been the largest employer and therefore a very important factor in the economic sustainability of these rural communities as well. So this is a double-edged sword. It's about the economy, but it's also very much about health care. And in terms of what to do, uh, we just need to get the health care delivery system to reflect the critically important role, and I know the congressman's going to talk about that in a minute, from a financial and, and equitable compensation way. But then we need to get business back to usual in the rural communities uh, where the virus transmission rates are particularly low. So if uh, there's a community that's got little or no ongoing virus transmission now, it's perfectly safe to get that mammogram or that cardiac stress test or, or bring your children in for your preschool physicals that you would normally need. And uh, we've been trying to share that message that it can be done safely and reliably, and it should be done because the longer we defer those kinds of things, the more medical consequences they're going to be. All right, Dr. Gold, thank you. Congressman Keller, I promise you we're going to get to you and we're going to talk about that bill that you and your colleagues have offered up. But we need to take a quick break. We're also going to take your phone calls. And so remember, our phone lines are open. We'd love to hear from you. 877-731-6733. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center after this. And welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Tammy Arinder. Joining us once again is University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and U.S. Congressman Fred Keller of Pennsylvania. Appreciate you guys being with us. We've had someone patiently waiting on the phone. Let's go ahead and take that call. Um, it's Bernita from North Carolina. What's your question? Yes, I was wanting to ask um, such in big cities like New York with heavy, heavy traffic or uh, maybe a China that has a lot of motorcades and stuff. When we're at traffic at a stoplight, and like, for example, I sneeze, and then I accelerate when the light changes, the car behind me, can that air be pulled in if I'm contagious and infect them? Interesting question. Dr. Gold, I, mean, I would assume that it wouldn't be, but you're the doctor. I'll let you answer that question. Well, you know, I was just thinking about it. It is a very good question. And uh, I certainly, uh, uh, Bernita, there's no uh, reports of that in the literature that I'm aware of. But your question is right on because of the recent interest in uh, an aerosolized uh, spread of this. I guess uh, my best advice was, uh, you know, if you're traveling with somebody uh, who you know uh, has uh, COVID or you think very likely has COVID, we should minimize travel outside of the home anyway. I mean, obviously, if you need a transport to health care or to the pharmacy or something like that, uh, you, we need to do it carefully. But, uh, you know, uh, generally, we really want to minimize uh, that kind of travel uh, anyway. But no, uh, you can leave your windows rolled down and, uh, and enjoy the summer weather. 
All right. Great answer. Thank you for that call, Bernita. Now, Congressman Keller, you have introduced a new bill called the Reviewing Urban and Rural Adjustments to Level Hospital Expenses and Lopsided Payments Act of 2020, or the shortened title Rural Help Act. Tell us what that's all about. You know, we did a lot of visits to the hospitals in rural Pennsylvania, in uh, north central, northeastern Pennsylvania. And what we what we experienced is we do have a, a, a aging population and uh, the Medicare payments uh, to uh, rural hospitals. Um, there's a disparity between that and urban and all, for, for some of the same procedures and, and the costing for those. Uh, you know, and what it costs to deliver he health care to people might be a little different in in uh, rural Pennsylvania than it is in, in the urban parts. And, you know, when we talk about making sure that we have accessible care and affordable care to uh, uh, Americans all across our nation, we need to make sure that uh, when, when people are going to the hospital, uh, you know, that our hospital is going to get compensated equitably uh, for providing that care, whether it's in, in uh, uh, rural Pennsylvania, at, uh, you know, in Williamsport or in, in Tioga County or Susquehanna County uh, versus, you know, somebody goes to get a similar procedure or have a similar stay in the hospital in uh, Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. So really, this this directs the uh, uh, HHS to take a look at this or to CMS, excuse me, CMS to look at this and uh, take and let's like look at the adjustments that need to be done because you got uh, Medicare severity diagnosis related group, which is MSDRG. And uh, we're taking a look at that and saying, you know, this group that requires care, let's make sure that our hospitals get compensated equitably. And that's, that's really what we're trying to do uh, so that uh, people don't have to travel hours uh, from rural America uh, to more urban areas to get the care they need and deserve. Right. Now, Congressman Keller, you did that, I believe, on, on July 9th. Well, already just today, moments before we went on the air, President Trump issued an executive order talking about rural America. It says the White House is launching an innovative payment model to enable rural health care transformation. And that is part of an executive order that came out today from the White House. And it appears that that is going to help level out, as you just mentioned, some of the um, payment, make sure there's no disparity. And it also talks about increasing investments in the physical and communications infrastructure. And so both of you are well aware of how some of these small rural hospitals are aging and they are, are really, they need an upgrade and an overhaul, especially when it comes to telemedicine, because let's both, let's all talk about that. Telemedicine, especially during COVID-19, has become critically important, hasn't it? Well, if oh, I could just jump in and yeah. talk about that, uh, when you're looking at, at being able to deliver health care, uh, when you're looking at people that work from home, when you're looking at, uh, you know, commerce, uh, education, all those things, uh, being able to do that remotely is so critical. And we in the CARES Act uh, put money in there to make sure that there would be reimbursements for telemedicine. But to do that, we need uh, more access, more rural broadband those kind of things. And we're really looking into that. And I'm, I'm glad to see the president take this step because it's so important. Uh, when we talk about infrastructure, you know, everybody thinks of roads and bridges and all the things you can see. We like to talk about the things that you don't see, which would be broadband internet access, the upgrades for our hospitals, so that care can get delivered cost effectively. And I, I think that's really going to be an important part of being able to make sure uh, people get the care they need. And then if there is somebody that needs to ha have a doctor look at something or communicate with their health care provider uh, and they're in this high risk category, they wouldn't have to, uh, you know, go out into a hospital or into a healthcare setting where people might be being seen for a disease that spreads sort of like COVID-19 or the flu or something like that. All right. So important. Dr. Gold, you want to comment on the telemedicine aspect? I sure do, because, uh, you know, you'd never imagine a uh, recovering heart surgeon saying that broadband coverage is one of the most important things in the delivery of uh, health care, but it absolutely is. And uh, we've learned through this COVID-19, uh, but we've had some indications before for taking care of rural Americans that the, uh, the, app, the ability to get quality broadband into the home, into their place of work, uh, into their community is absolutely critical, but not just for patients and their families, 
for routine types of matters, which has gone up by 200, 300 fold over the last three months across the United States. But actually, for a lot of the rural health care providers who want to show somebody a scan or an x-ray or a microscope section and say, you know, what do you think about this? And this way they can participate in tumor boards, they can participate in cardiac cath conferences, and they can get all the consultative help that they need, and yet the patients get to stay at home in their rural community and get the care that they need with the combination of their local uh, healthcare professionals and experts uh, across the country and around the world. So it's, uh, it's really a very critical thing, and I am uh, really pleased to hear uh, that the president made this announcement today. Yes, it is awesome. You know, I actually was able to sit in on a webinar this past Friday with uh, Tom Vilsack, and he gave a great analogy. He said, COVID-19 has basically ripped the Band-Aid off of the problems that already existed in rural America with rural health care. And um, I assume, Congressman Keller, you have probably seen this firsthand. I know you were able to go around and visit hospitals across your state. What did you see? What was that like? Well, the visits we did, um, much of which were, occurred prior to prior to COVID nineteen, um, you know, we saw we saw people trying to make sure that they could deliver the care effectively, and and get the job done. And I'd actually participated uh, over the past few years prior to getting to getting into Congress. I was in the General Assembly in Pennsylvania, and participated in some telemedicine uh, uh, activities with with our hospitals. And it's really amazing, and I think Dr. Gold hit it, that you can you can take uh, a patient, and maybe even if they're going to a to a, a facility in one place, you can get an expert uh, that might be uh, you know a couple hundred miles away to be able to look look at what the the doctor that's providing the care, the the healthcare providers providing the care right there, and and help get a second opinion and guide the diagnosis. Uh, we are we are getting back out, having some more roundtables uh, in. Uh, uh, central and northeastern Pennsylvania to understand now that we've seen COVID-19, what other things do we need to be looking at? Uh, the, the Rural Help Act is one of the things we saw when we did our initial our, our initial roundtables, and that's why we introduced it. And that's why we think it's so important to make sure that our rural hospitals have the, the resources they need um, to be able to provide the care. So uh, looking very much forward to, to getting back out and, and seeing what work we can do to help our health care providers support the population in rural America. And Congressman Keller, I know that we've already talked about the bill that you, you have co-written and co-sponsored, but let's talk more specifically. I know to your home state there, Pennsylvania, what will it actually do for the hospitals there and health care providers? Well, what it will do is it will make sure that in the area I represent, uh, and, and when you look at the hospitals, we, we have we have hospitals in about eight of eight of the fifteen counties I represent, and a lot of them are are looking at making sure that they can continue to provide the care. We actually, unfortunately, in, in our one community at a hospital that closed within the within the last year, and uh, you know, making sure that that people have the care they need, and that's really what this is driven to. Because if if they aren't uh, receiving the the payment they need to help cover the costs of providing health care in rural America. Uh, the hospitals are going to be faced with, uh, you know, not, not, not being able to stay open. And, and that's really what we're focused at doing here. When, and, and some of this had been done in the past for outpatient care. Uh, we're simply saying, hey, we provide care inpatient in these hospitals, and, and our hospitals need to make sure that they have the adequate resources. Much, and, and it's not looking at costing any more money. It's looking at saying, if we're going to pay this much, maybe we're paying too much in, in an urban area, and some of that reimbursement needs to be looked at, and, and uh, those rates need to be adjusted uh, to make sure we can provide the care and cover the costs in rural America. Now, so far, two leading health care groups are actually supporting this bill. What are you hearing from them? Well, uh, we're hearing that, uh, you know, when they took a look at this, uh, you know, they're, they're saying that it's, it's, it's get, taking us in the right direction and uh, really providing the, the, the uh, equitable distribution of the resources that they need. So that they've been actually very helpful in making sure that they can do that because they want to deliver high quality, cost effective care to vulnerable uh, populations. And uh, this, this would very much help that. 
because they have um, you know some financial challenges and uh, these these payments uh, you know need to make sure that they're balanced uh, and we're getting being able to, to to cover the cost for rural America and, and when you look at what's happening you know this is focusing on on Medicare right now because we do have an aging population in rural America so uh, you know start here there's there's likely going to be more work to, to, to be done on this but we wanted to rather than just you know wait to get things done we thought the the more we started to step up and address these issues uh you know as soon as we we got the, the uh, coalition together it would benefit everybody it would benefit the people that live in rural america it would benefit the uh, the health care providers and uh, that's really why we we introduced this about a month ago and we're we're looking at uh, continue we're continuing to gain support and and we're very optimistic that we can get something done with this uh you know, here this fall when we get back in session. Well, I know we were actually just looking at a quote from the Rural Hospital Association where they were supporting your bill for sure. The Rural Hospital Coalition, actually, it says our 65 hospital members are proud to support H.R. 7534, the reviewing urban and rural adjustment to level hospital expenses and lopsided payments, otherwise known as the Rural Help Act. Well, the Rural Hospital Coalition letter reads that, as you know, delivering high quality, cost efficient care to vulnerable populations is a particular challenge for those in rural areas where communities face unique barriers to health care coverage and access. This important legislation would shed light into the financial challenges facing rural hospitals and the payment mechanisms that drive continued imbalances. That's from the Rural Hospital Coalition. So you are already seeing some support there and hopefully that bill will move forward. Now, Dr. Gold, you've also looked at this bill. What are your thoughts on it? Well, I, I think it's a very important step forward to shine some sunlight and, into this question. You know, I've had the opportunity. Uh, there are 63 critical access hospitals, at least last time I counted, uh, in Nebraska, and I visited 60 of them over the last several years. And I've come to really understand how delicately balanced they are from a financial perspective while they're trying very hard to deliver quality health care to their rural communities and keep those communities uh, vibrant. You know, they're a combination of inpatient and outpatient services, laboratory services, physical therapy, and rehabilitation. And many of them are built and, and sustained in rural communities <clears throat> where disease prevalence, you know, there's just another recent very important study that showed that the prevalence of high blood pressure or hypertension, diabetes, uh, heart disease, asthma, COPD, are actually disproportionately higher in farming and ranching communities, small rural communities, than they are in the large urban cities. Now, of course, there are exceptions to that as a rule, but there's no shortage of these comorbidities, which translates into more need for inpatient and outpatient health care at an affordable level, and frankly, uh, tragically, uh, more mortality uh, from COVID-19 when it does strike uh, into these rural communities. So uh, I think this is a really great idea to shed some light on this and to try to create equity if we can. You know, that, that, that's, what, you know that's what good governance is, is to identify these kinds of problems, get good data to make decisions, and then act on it. And Congressman Keller, can you tell us the next steps for this bill? Well, right now, again, we've been getting uh, support in the House, and we've, we've had co-sponsors also reaching over into the uh, to the Senate and seeing if, uh, you know, who we can get to take up the charge there so that then when we get something done and get to them, you know, they, they're already through that. And also talking to the administration and let them know uh, the importance of what we're doing uh, to move this bill forward. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of uh, right now uh, getting it uh, before the committees, uh, working with my colleagues in the House, uh, you know, getting support this month. Uh, some of some of our visits uh, to the hospitals, getting them to, you know, contact uh, their members of Congress and and uh, work with leadership to get it get it to uh, through committee into the House floor. And then also, uh, you know, to make sure that the Senate uh, takes it up and it gets onto the president's desk. We actually were able to do that with an amendment to uh, to some bills to the, the Older Americans Act last year when it dealt, dealt with, uh, you know, scans for, for older Americans that had falls because there was a lot of a lot of, a lot of times they had a, a head trauma and some of that was going undetected. So we were able to get that done as an amendment to another bill 
Uh, so we're looking at every option we have to make sure that we can get this done and, and, and have this uh, before everybody and make sure that we get this uh, imbalance figured out so that we can continue to have quality health care in rural America for those people who deserve it so much. Anything else you think Congress could be doing at this time to support rural hospitals and rural health care as a whole? Well, I, I think we need to, we, we did a lot in the CARES Act. Uh, is there more to be done? Absolutely. Because as Dr. Gold had mentioned, uh, while we were trying to make sure there were resources available, should there be, um, you know, a lot of uh, COVID-19 need, uh, you know, there were some procedures and, and I won't call them elective because as we discussed earlier, uh, I don't think people are looking at getting getting their heart checked or their stress test or those things as elective procedures, but uh, certainly necessary. But uh, so there's hospitals that have not done those kind of procedures, and that has really hurt what their you know their bottom line because that was, that's sort of what they're having, and then they're not seeing patients because people aren't going to going in for these things, and some people aren't going to the emergency room um, or other other urgent care places. And uh, they're, they're seeing some impacts from that. So I think we really need to take a look at how that effect is and what we should be addressing as we go forward. And quite frankly, now that things are opening up a little bit and we're able to have our roundtables, that's what I'm looking forward to be able to do this upcoming month of August when we're in, in, in the district work period to uh, discuss with our hospitals uh, in rural America what we should be looking at and uh, how we address those issues because uh, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be, it's, it's affected probably different parts of, of our Commonwealth differently, depending upon uh, the amount of treatment they gave for COVID-19, but certainly hospitals in need of help. And, and that's really what we want to make sure because the, the COVID-19, in, in addition to, to how tragic it's been for, for, for new cases and for people that have died from it and needed care, uh, the other side of it is there's people that have gone without care for other, other diseases or ailments. And uh, we're, we're going to need to make sure that the, the health care system is ready and, and, and equipped to handle that uh, when, when we start to see that uh, care uh, come back. And we've seen that in, in rural Pennsylvania here a little bit. Some of the hospitals have gotten back to doing more uh, of, of those screenings, of those other procedures that, would, uh, that, that need to be done but are not COVID-19 related and, and something that I would say is is uh, you know maybe an inpatient or as as acute as as dealing with the COVID nineteen. Right, may not be life threatening, but it it certainly affects quality of life. Doctor Gold, would you like to add anything to that? You know, I would, Tammy. Uh, uh, one of the things that I hear all the time when I visit our rural hospitals is I always say, <clears throat> "What are the top three things that the university could do to help you?" And uh, it always is the same thing. It's uh, Doctor Gold. It's Workforce, workforce, and workforce. And by the way, Jeff, if you're not listening, we need more workforce. <laughs> and this is doctors, nurses, pharmacists, therapists. It's all of that. <clears throat> so the solution to this is to create rural training tracks, particularly for doctors and nurses and pharmacists and others, and to be sure that there's a mechanism by which individuals are identified. <clears throat> you know, the single best predictor of getting somebody to want to work in a rural community is if they grew up in that community, they went to med school or nursing school or pharmacy school, <clears throat> and they turn around and say, I want to work in this community. But if they can't get a residency or a fellowship or a training opportunity, they're going to get recruited off into some big city uh, who's probably going to pay them a little bit more and offer them a different kind of quality of life. And so uh, anything that we can do to create workforce incentives is going to help support rural America's health care system, which is going to help support the quality of life in rural America. Excellent point. A lot of people do want to go back home, but you've got to be able to make a living. We're going to take a quick break, but our phone lines are open. would love to hear from you and have you on the show. 877-731-6733. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center after this. 
Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Tammy Orinder. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and U.S. Congressman Fred Keller of Pennsylvania. We appreciate you guys taking time today. Very important subject and very timely right now. Let's talk about kids getting ready to go back to school. I have heard so many different combinations of virtual school, online, in person. What are they going to do? Um, Congressman Keller, what's your take on all of this? What are you seeing in Pennsylvania as far as kids going back to school? Well, we're seeing a lot of our, our local school districts start to come out with plans that include, I'll say, a hybrid of some in-class learning, uh, maybe starting a little later in the day, uh, uh, in school a couple days, then uh, uh, online a, a few days. Um, I, I think we can we can do it. We can get it open safely if we follow the Department of Health and CDC guidelines. Saw a lot of good plans. Um, one thing I, I'd like to just sort of say, and when it comes to schooling, is um, there's a children's museum in, in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, and I know that the paper had mentioned that they they reopened this week, and you know mentioned some of what they had done. So I, I think uh, when we look at uh, what's happening. Uh, I know that the school districts are going to be able to do it. Uh, we did provide a lot of resources uh, for the, through the CARES Act for school districts. Pennsylvania got $523 million uh, for this. We have 500 school districts. So, you know, if you, you do quick math for the public sector, you know, the public side of it, uh, you know, there's money there to help support the schools and some additional costs they would have to make sure that the, the schools can reopen safely. But I know we have a lot of talented, uh, uh, thoughtful people that, that work very hard in, in our school system, whether it's the public school system or some of our some of our private schools, uh, that, that will be able to figure out how to do it safely, follow that guidance, and make sure that our kids can get back to school. You know, the American Academy of Pediatrics says that, you know, kids should get back to school. It's, it's good for them. It's healthy. They need to be able to do that. And I think we can figure out how to do it safely. It's just a matter of... Uh, you know, seeing what fits and what works well in 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 rural Pennsylvania might look a little different when you get into the uh, you know the places like Philadelphia County or Allegheny County. So I think we need to keep that in mind too. That it's not going to be a one size fits all uh, thing depending upon where you are in in uh, in the country. So I think we can do it. Uh, the, the busing, I saw I saw a picture of the bus there. The busing may look different. Uh, things will be a little different, but. Again, I think we can do it. We've, we've been very resourceful uh, in the past. Uh, and I, again, our, our, kid, our kids, uh, you know, they will, they will do what we need them to do. And uh, I think we can do it and have kids back in school uh, learning this, this uh, fall. Dr. Gold, your thoughts? Sure. Well, I mean, to start off with, uh, every parent and most of our students and certainly uh, our communities want to send our kids back to school. They want to send our kids back to school because they don't want to delay or, or, or slow down their educational journey. But in many instances, this is about food security. This is about health care. Uh, this is about socialization of younger children. So it's really critical to get our kids back to school in an effective and safe way. But there are a number of things that I, I think are, have become increasingly obvious. One is that the K-5 generation is different than middle school and high school. And of course, we're not talking about higher ed now. We're just talking about the K-12 system uh, in general. And the K-5 <laughs> students, first of all, they don't do well with remote education as well as the middle school and high schoolers do. Secondly, they're much more in need of socialization at that age. And thirdly, and probably very importantly, is there's now good scientific evidence, at least thus far, and it could change tomorrow, but there is scientific evidence that these little kitties do not transmit the virus with the same degree of uh, transmissibility as children over 10 years of age do. And so if they're transmitting the virus less and they need to be in school more, there needs to be a plan, if at all possible, to get them back as the first part of the back-to-school move. Now, we've also learned, uh, as the congressman said, is that there are a lot of differences between rural and urban communities, and even among and between the urban communities and among and between the rural communities. And what I mean by that, it's going to be very different to bring kids back to school that have virus rates that are in the 100 per million per day category, the 200 uh, you know, cases per million per day category, or 
to put it in different terms, with positive test ratios of 24, 25, 28 percent, as opposed to under 5 percent or under 1 percent. And so they need to be two different things that occur. One is you need to open schools safely uh, in communities uh, that have reasonable control of the transmission of the virus. And then you need to put appropriate precautions in place, whether they're hand sanitizers, face masks, uh, making the class size smaller. You know, we've worked very closely with many, many school districts uh, here in our part of the Midwest. And there are no two that are alike. <clears throat> some are going to every other day. Some are going to three days a week. Some are going to mornings versus afternoons. Some are going to K-5 only. So they're all different, but they're all predicated on creating a safe learning environment. And I can tell you that the school districts around here, and I'm sure the same thing's true in Pennsylvania, have said we all want our children back in school, but we all want them to be safe, and we don't want them bringing virus home to get our parents and grandparents, you know, vulnerable neighbors and friends sick. So it's a very, very delicate balance. And it's going to play out over the next couple of weeks because in the next couple of weeks, our kids, you know, in some communities here uh, in the Midwest are already heading back to school uh, this week and next week. And so we're going to be seeing more and more of that. And uh, we're going to have to be thoughtful and flexible and be willing to change if things change in the community. So a uh, pretty complex question. It is. And like you said, everybody is dealing with it differently. I think we're going to see a lot of kids um, wear those masks, have that hand sanitizer. And again, it becomes part of your norm and a part of your routine. And I think the kids can adapt to that. Sometimes I think parents have a little harder time adapting to those um, new terms and, and getting ready every day and doing everything. But I think we're going to see that in our classrooms as well. Dr. Gold, have you seen some unique strategies that, that have proven successful to help prevent the spread among rural populations? Uh, you know, Tammy, we've talked about a lot of them, and I think rural populations are already uh, spread out a good deal, particularly our farming and ranching communities. So they start off with, uh, with the fortunate benefit of not being compacted. And indeed, a lot of what happens in terms of this disease spread really relates to what happens when they go shopping, when they go into town for supplies, uh, when they gather on weekends, if they go to church or, or other uh, social gatherings and that sort of thing. What I've seen in the rural communities that we serve, which is really very prominent, is there was initially a considerable resistance to wearing a mask just because it was uncomfortable and people weren't used to it. But with the widespread of the use of masking, I've seen the rural and urban and the rural and you know farming and ranching communities take hold of that. And you know, they're they're very used to protecting themselves from pollen and dust and grain particles, and now they're willing to protect themselves uh, from COVID-19. So that plus the access to uh, rural uh, telemedicine health care, I think is part of the secret sauce that's going to keep our rural communities healthy and get us through to a point that we have safe and effective vaccines, which, by the way, I'm hoping are out before Thanksgiving. Yes, hoping we can get vaccine out there soon. I tell you what, we've uh, had a couple of people on the phones we've not been able to get to, but I think Richard from California, uh, you still with us? What question do you have? Yes, um, I live in a, a rural section here uh, in uh, Northern California, and uh, most of my neighbors believe that this is a hoax and not to be taken seriously. And um, I'm just wondering how I can get through to these, these people. And when I ask them something like, uh, would you mind if your surgeon does not wear a mask, they get terribly angry. And uh, I'm just trying to find out what it is that I can inform these people with because all of the information they give me are things that can only be found on social media, which, of course, is just filled with misinformation. How can I get these people sure. to uh, convince them that, to follow the science uh, to protect me and, and themselves from their misinformation? Dr. Gold? Oh, Richard, that, that could be one of the best questions of the night. And... Uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, your colleagues and friends are not the only people asking that exact type of question. Uh, you know, my, my answer to them is they do need to have reliable sources of information, and social media is full of all kinds of misinformation. But uh, you look at the numbers of people that are hospitalized. Uh, you know, we just talked uh, not too long ago uh, about more than four and a half million American infections. We talked about over 155,000 American deaths uh, in less than four months. I mean, you think about it, the entire loss uh, to the American uh, workforce and to the American population during the Second World War was just over 425,000 individuals over the many years uh, of that combat that occurred uh, in Europe and, else, and you know, across the globe. And now we're talking about 155,000 confirmed cases, not to mention what is probably at least twice that many uh, not confirmed cases with numbers that, if not controlled, could easily double by the Christmas holidays, easily double uh, by the Christmas holidays. And so my best advice to you is, uh, is, is you know, be a good steward. Wear your mask. Uh, provide people with access to quality information. It doesn't make any difference, frankly, uh, which media channel you choose. It doesn't make any difference whether you come from the red or the blue side of the aisle. This is a very, very real issue. And I can tell you, as a practicing surgeon for 25 years, the day never came for myself or any members of my team, should I wear a mask, should I not wear a mask, should I scrub my hands, should I not scrub my hands. Of course we did, because we wanted to take the very best care of our patients. And this is a time for America to reach the same set of conclusions. We want to take the very best care of the communities we care and love. Right, taking that responsibility. We have just a couple of minutes left. Um, final thoughts? Dr. Uh, Dr. Gull, you want to go first? Uh, well, I think I've said my piece. Uh, we all <laughs> own this, uh, and we're, uh, you know, we're, we're in this together, and we've got to get through to a point of uh, availability of safe and effective vaccine. And uh, we'll unpack that a little bit more, I'm sure, next week. But uh, a very, very important time. America is on a critical journey, and we've got to be sure that we do the very best we can. All right. Congressman Keller? Uh, Final thoughts? Thank you for having me this evening and, and the ability to communicate uh, to, to rural America on, on such important issues. Um, you know, when we're looking at COVID-19, I know Americans are the, 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 the most resourceful. Uh, we care about our communities. Um, you know, we'll get through this, but it's a matter of us doing it together. It's a matter of us understanding you know what 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 it is what it is we're fighting and and how we best uh, succeed. And uh, as Dr. Gold mentioned, we we hope to soon have a, a vaccine. But up until that point point, we need to make sure that we're all taking the precautions, uh, doing things safely. I think we can do that. We can get our kids in school. Uh, but uh, I, I do know uh, as Americans, we always we always rise to the challenge to help one another and uh, and get through this. So you. Know, I look forward to being able to uh, get out to more of the rural health care providers, seeing what we can do as Congress to make sure that uh, that the rural health care providers have uh, the resources they need, that, our, that, that America's families have the resources they need, and, and uh, we all get through this together. All right. Well, Congressman Keller, Dr. Gold, we appreciate both of you, all of your efforts and the initiative that you take to help keeping rural America safe. I love your, <laughs> I love your mask. I've got mine right here too. Uh, try and wear it every time I am around people and walk outside. Thank you so much for being with us and we appreciate you. Stick around for Rural America Live tonight at 8 Eastern. We talk with founder and owner of Total Feeds, Dr. Harry Anderson. Learn how the right nutrition can make all the difference in your animal's performance. I'm Tammy Arinder. Good night. Right.